Call to order uh, City Council meeting, special meeting of October 28th, 2013. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right, uh, tonight we're going to have a study session on the Transit Village. So I guess that is the uh, next item. Okay. So, Mr. Rinalpi, if someone wanted to speak under public comment, how's this going to go? They wanted to speak at this meeting and the other and the next meeting. They can legally do that. So should we have public comment now? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend you change the order to right, public okay. comment we'll now. Right, okay. We'll change this order. So public comment, this is for items not on the posted agenda for this evening, which of course is the Transit Village for the study session. So if there's anyone wishing to speak that's not on this agenda, you can come forward. And I have one speaker card, Mr. Carpio. You're up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is André Carpio, and I want to remind you about the theft of the solar car. And, and this is a very important meeting because we are dealing with a, a new item in the city of San Carlo, which is a housing. And everybody should be aware that there is a, going to be a critical decision about the election of the city council. And I plan to put my input in the subject of the solar car for those who are incumbent and for those who are seeking candidacy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Carpio. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in public comment tonight on items not on the posted agenda? Okay. Um, also, Mr. Uh, Rubens, it says report from closed session. There's no closed session? There's no closed session okay, on so this meeting. Well, we cap 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 captured that. So we'll go back to 3A. Study session, Transit Village. Mr. Seve, are you up or someone else? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Colette Menier. I am the contract planner who is um, assisting the city with the processing of this development application. I'm just going to do a very short introduction and then um, the Applicant team, Sam Trans and Legacy and their consultants will present the project and then I will present the recommendation from the Planning Commission. So I just wanted to remind you where we've been with this project, which started when Legacy was selected by Sam Trans as the developer for a portion of the railroad corridor. The initial application was for 319 units. They refined their initial proposal in response to uh, community input from uh, meetings with community members and submitted a project which was the basis of an EIR. A draft EIR was prepared and submitted for public review in 2009 and 2010. Comments came in on that document and in 2012, a document which contained the response to all the public comments was issued. The Planning Commission held a number of meetings to discuss the adequacy of that document and finally in the fall of 2012 recommended to the City Council that the document be certified as adequate to evaluate the project. Throughout this process began in 2000 12 and in 2013, there was a series of stakeholder meetings with the uh, use of a mediator, Dr. Spano, that resulted in a list of issues, the identification of some solutions, and also a list of things that were of concern to the, the stakeholders but weren't really part of the project, really part of the existing um, quality of life issues uh, for that neighborhood and those, and those uh, stakeholders. Those have been summarized in a list that's included as attachment, uh, included in attachment 13A, which is a list of issues that the community would still like you to consider, even though they can't 
be addressed through the uh, this project. There were community meetings that both the city organized and Legacy. The city council began its consideration of the adequacy of the EIR in December of 2012, and in January, January 28, 2013, the council found the EIR was adequate to evaluate the document and uh, the project and certified the document. As a result of all of this process, Legacy again took a look at their project and further revised it and submitted that revised project in May of 2013. When uh, the legacy team presents the project, they'll go over those kinds of project revisions. Other bodies also reviewed the project. The Transportation and Circulation um, Commission reviewed the project, looked at the traffic analysis, asked that the Planning Commission and the City Council look to the environmental review document and the traffic report as part of that that was, that was part of that uh, evaluation uh, in order to understand the, the traffic consequences and recommended the adoption of transportation demand management measures as part of the project approval. The Economic Development Advisory Commission also took a look at the project and a report prepared by SRG on the fiscal impacts of the project, which found that the project would be fiscally positive, that there would be enough revenue generated to cover the costs of providing municipal services to this project. Beginning in September, on September 16th, the Planning Commission began its consideration of the merits of the project and held a public hearing on September 16th, closed the public hearing and continued their discussions and del deliberations to September 30th and October 7th, at which time the body, the, the commission voted 4-1 to recommend approval of the plan development to the city council. Briefly, just as to kick off the consideration or understanding of the project, it, it includes three separate but related projects. We're, we're calling them the mixed use project, which is the project that consists of eight buildings that include 280 apartment, build, apartment units, as well as uh, over 30,000 square feet of commercial and retail space. The relocated transit center, which includes where the buses would come in, turn around, as well as the commuter parking lot. And the remaining portion of the rail corridor, the South Railroad Corridor, for which no development is currently proposed, but there is some landscaping uh, along the street right of way that is included as part of the conditions of approval. And this is just briefly shows the three components. Um, the depot is here. Holly Street is here. Four buildings to the north of Holly. Two residential buildings and two commercial buildings to the south. The transit center and the parking. This area, which is identified as, um, was earlier identified as multi-purpose, additional parking will be designed into that area. And then from Arroyo Avenue South is the South Rail Corridor for which no uh, development is proposed at this time. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to the legacy team uh, and Sam Trans. How do I need to escape from this? Thank you, by the way, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm um, Sherry Scott with Christiani Johnson Architects, and I think I'm we'll sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry, Sherry Scott with Christiani Johnson Architects. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think we'll start with giving an overview of the Transit Center. Brian Fitzpatrick from Sam Trans will give us an overview of the Transit Center. And then I'll come back and give an overview of the project um, as it is. Also with a 
sort of synopsis of the evolution of the project over a series of site plan changes, and then also what the proposed conditions of approval, um, would, how, how that would affect the project as well. Good evening, members of the council, Mr. Mayor, Brian Fitzpatrick, <clears throat> manager of real estate and property development for Samtrans. I'd like to thank Sherry for introducing me and also getting the slide on the right uh, page. There's always doubt on our team whether I can do that myself, so I appreciate that. Um, Believe me, I understand, personally. <laughs> <Yes>. I'm, <clears throat> I'm sort of uniquely suited to kind of kick this thing off because I'm one of the few people, and, and there's others in this room who, who've been here as well, but I've been here through somewhat of the beginning of this land use discussion that started years ago. And uh, so what I'm going to try to do here today is talk to you just about a couple things. One, give you a little bit of history of the land. And this is stuff you probably all heard before, so I'll try not to bore you. Talk about a little bit about Samtran's vision. And then finally, talk a little bit about uh, how I think that all the various entities that are involved in this are going to work together to make the best possible project for this city. So first, I want to start out. The land that this project is being built on was purchased as part of the grade separation project. And most of you probably remember that in order to build the grade separation project, they created what's called a shoe fly, which basically means taking the trains <laughs> off the current tracks that they were operating on, bringing them onto this property while the grade separation was built up, then moving the trains back onto the grade separation when that was completed. That necessitated using the land for a long period of time, and more importantly, it necessitated the relocation of a number of businesses from that land. Now, this grade separation project was actually built by the city of San Carlos in partnership with the city of Belmont. Uh, San Carlos took the lead in that for Belmont. And then this land was purchased uh, with money from the San Mateo County Transportation Authority in order to accom uh, accommodate that project. So at the end of that project, the businesses had been moved. The trains had been moved back onto their grade separation, and there was some, some vacant land out there. So the city, uh, as is its job and its purview, looked at the land, and they created a railroad land use committee for this. There were a few iterations of this. Um, I first became involved in 2001 when I first got to, to the Sam, to Sam Chance, to the district. Uh, and the idea was this, this railroad land use committee was created with a cross-section of all people from San Carlos. Business people, residents, it was, uh, I, I participated, there were, um, it was staffed by San Carlos staff, and they started talking about the goals and objectives for developing of this land. The idea is to create an underpinning at the city end as to what was going to be out there, what the vision would be. So in uh, August 2003, the city council amended the West Side specific plan with resolutions 2003, 78, and 79 that effectively talked about the goals and objectives for the development of this land. Um, based on those policy uh, guidelines set by the city, Samtrans then issued a RFP for the site, um, or, or an RFQ more like. We were looking at qualifications more so than a proposal. That was issued on June 23, 2004. And what that RFP did is it included the reference to the city's goals and policies. What we wanted to be able to tell developers is, this is what the city's looking for on the site. We wanted to give them guidance for that. Um, it also included uh, Samtran's goals and objectives were listed there. There were references to a number of city policy documents in there. City staff participated in the selection process. There was a panel that was created. There was city staff on that panel, Samtran staff on that panel. We reviewed the proposals. We had seven proposals. Some extremely good proposals. Um, Legacy, obviously, ended up being the winner of that. One of the other proposals out there submitted by BRE, this was the number two best proposal, uh, suggested 453 units on this site. The selection committee looked at that and said, this isn't consistent with the goals and objectives that were, that were set forth here, and we think it's a little pioneering for San Carlos. We didn't think they got it. Legacy's proposal at the time included 320 units. Um, the idea behind most of the selection panel was that Legacy really understood the feel, the look, and the scale of San Carlos. We felt that they understood that, this, this selection committee, so they were, they were chosen. So the reason I give you this background is this isn't an out of the blue thing. Legacy didn't walk into San Carlos, come in and say, we want to develop something that's our vision and, and try to ram that down anybody's throat. This was done with a very well thought out process. It was city-led 
and uh, then San Carlos uh, and Samtrans work together to find an appropriate developer to manifest that vision. So let's talk a little bit about Samtrans goals and objectives. Why is Samtrans developing this land? What's, what's, what, what are our objectives? Um, from a transit, you know, egghead planner point of view, you guys may have heard the term transit-oriented development. The idea is, is that transit riders get to transit on a variety of different modes. Some drive their cars, some take the bus, some take shuttles, some walk, some bike. There are a variety of different ways that people get to the station. Our view is that if we bring 600 people to the station, we're going to drive ridership and we're going to ri drive the good type of ridership. We're going to be driving the ridership of people who aren't driving to the station. They're walking to the station. So we're getting you know, the, the, the green riders. It's, it's a big advantage to, to our agency to have that kind of vision. This is a vision that's shared throughout the United States in a variety of planning circles that this is sort of the wave of the future. Um, secondly, we feel that we're providing a housing choice for people who want to have great downtowns and a connection to the city. Um, San Carlos has a great downtown. You guys have a, a proximity between your transit station and your downtown that is not necessarily unique on the peninsula, but it's shared with all the other cities that have really vibrant, great downtowns. That's why you guys in a, you know, a, a fair, fairly small city have such an amount of great restaurants, because you already have this great downtown. So people who want to share that experience, be downtown, they, they may choose to live here. They don't have to, but that may be a choice. So Sam Trans likes a housing choice. Kind of an important issue here is I take the, the train on, a, on a, about three times a week is my goal. And when you come out of the, the, the station and you walk down in the area that is going to in the future be our public plaza, you have cars, shuttles, uh, any kind of truck that needs to access that area, buses, all sharing this future pedestrian plaza with pedestrians. That's a tough scenario when you come out and there's cars and buses driving you know, all around the area. Every day I walk around a shuttle when I come off my train. One of the things that this project is going to create is a public plaza. Let's see here. In this area right here, the public plaza is going to give priority to what we in transit call the mode of access that are pedestrians and bicycles. We're going to separate all those cars and trucks and buses and we're going to put them at their own entrance and we're going to connect the transit center for the pedestrian directly out to El Camino Real. Um, so we're giving a priority to pedestrians, um, which is, you know, I think a, a very huge advantage. Um, right now, if you look at the parking lots, and I'm going to specifically choose to use the term parking lots for what San Carlos has for Caltrain right now, you have two parking lots that flank the historical transit center. Those parking lots park 226 cars. There's a bus stop in there. But if you go out there at, let's say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to see buses taking up 10, 12 parking spots doing what we call laying over. They're, they're, they're sitting there. The reason for that is, is that you have a parking lot out there. What we are going to build now is a full-blown modern transit center. What does that mean? That means we're going to have dedicated areas for buses. We're going to have dedicated areas for park and ride. Let me show you a couple of these things. Right, let's see. Right down here, you see dedicated areas for buses. We've actually changed this a little bit now. We can get three buses in here, not just the two that you see. You have a dedicated kiss and ride area right here. So when you come to drop somebody off at the transit station, right now, you stop on the red curb and you let people out in the transit center. The shuttles currently stop on the red curb to let people out in, in the parking lots that are out there now. In this area, our shuttles will be there to leverage this transit center. Kiss and ride. When you drop somebody off, you'll be there to drop them off at that, at that center. The other thing that we're going to be there to do is I know there's discussion in this city of potentially moving shuttles from the east to the west side. This project will enable that to happen. Should the city council choose to uh, decide that shuttles should serve the west side, this transit center can accommodate for that whereas the current parking lots that we have out there now can't. So you're getting a full-blown modern transit center as part of this. Um, this project is going to increase connectivity between east and west through connections on El Camino Real. One of the things that you'll notice in this project is we're going to create an El Camino Real connection with very specific 
uh, features in El Camino that will, that will say these are pedestrians crossing this area. So while El Camino Real will not get smaller, it won't get, the, the gap won't be any less, it sure will be from a pedestrian perspective and from a car perspective. It's going to be a scenario where you're going to respect the pedestrian coming from this pedestrian-only plaza across this specially marked area of El Camino Real. So we feel we're connecting east and west. We're getting the population that's on the east side over there through this transit center, through this very active transit center across El Camino Real, connecting this to this great downtown that you have in San Carlos, allowing more flexibility there. Uh, and then finally, I think everybody shares the goal of redeveloping this long, vacant land. Um, it's, it's land that, that, is, that is begging for something to happen out there. This project will do that. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk a little about the, about the roles of each party. Um, I've found in my discussions of this project that, you know, typically we're not used to two public agencies being involved in development land. Usually you've got a developer, private landowner, public agency doing the entitlement. I think it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about the relationship between these entities. I like to think of it as a triangle. Each of the three entities, Legacy, the City, and Samtrans, have a specific role in this project. We want to create a balance so we get the best possible project. So the way that I see this relationship working is that the developer is going to build the project. They're going to access financial markets to find the funding to buy this project. They're going to determine what works and what doesn't work in terms of the type of units they provide, the, the housing that they're going to provide, the markets they're going to serve on that end. They're going to build this thing in a way that makes sense. Samtrans, we're the landowner, we're also the transit experts. So what we're going to do is we are going to be building the transit center. We're working internally to make it the most fully functioning transit center in this long, skinny piece of land. We want to get it to be as fully functioning as we can make it. We're going to build that transit center. We're going to integrate it into the project. We're going to make sure that that works. That's our role. And then the city, I think, has the most important role of all, which is to use the policy tools at your disposal to ensure that we build a project that works best within the fabric of this city. You guys are going to determine what it's going to look like, you know, how big it's going to be, how it's going to function. That's extremely important. And I think it's important that we all work together to figure out an appropriate development in this site, because I think it goes without saying that in 10 years, we're going to look back on this project. We have one chance to redevelop this land. If we look back 10 years from now and we say, oh man, we should have gone seven stories, we should have gone eight stories, you know, we're behind the curve, or maybe we should have done, you know, one house on this property. Whatever decisions we make right now, it has to be balanced in the right way through this important process so that we get a great uh, development. And so uh, I stand ready, and I know Legacy does as well, to answer any questions that you may have as we go through this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Respect. Okay. Again, I'm Sherry Scott with Christiani Johnson Architects, and I have Paul Letieri from the Gazzardo Partnership Landscape Architects for the project. So we're going to go through a few slides and just explain the overview of the project as it stands now, and then we're also going to give a brief history of some of the major changes that the project's gone through um, to get to this point. Um, so we'll start with the depot area. And the design um, inspiration and the design guidelines that are set out by the, the city's general plan highlight um, the Drake Building and the historic train depot as being sort of touchstones, touch points for design inspiration for the project. And so as we designed the commercial buildings around uh, the historic depot building, we had to keep the historic nature of that building in, in mind and we really wanted to respect um, the, the place that that holds in the community. Um, so we met with the State Historical Preservation Organization and had them review our drawings uh, at a couple critical points. And basically the guidelines that, that we had from them were to scale the building down as we, came, as we approached the depot building, uh, to frame the depot building while still preserving views. And then also um, they were very interested in creating the pedestrian plaza around the building so the building can really be appreciated at the ground level, whereas now it's, it's a bit like a, it, it's just a drive-by. It's, it's difficult to pause and reflect on uh, the building as it's there. So as you can see from the plan, this is the depot building in plan. 
the two commercial buildings, the building to the north is, uh, we'll call building seven from this point on, and the re retail building to the south is retail building eight. Um, so these buildings step back in plan from the depot building to create uh, an angled view corridor to the depot. They also step down in height as you get towards the depot. They go from three stories in the retail building eight down to two, and then one for the piece that's closest to the uh, depot building. And similarly with building seven, which is a smaller building, it's two stories, uh, but it has a large one-story terrace uh, directly adjacent to the depot building. And so I feel like we've um, done a lot to accommodate that. And we actually got a letter of support from the Historic Preservation Organization um, highlighting that we've reflected their concerns in the, in the design, so. <clears throat> okay, hi, I'm Paul Letiri. Hi. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about the, the plaza itself. The idea behind the plaza was to try to allow it to be flexible as well as to accommodate all the pedestrian activity that Brian talked about a little, a little while ago. Uh, we're going to be taking the, the four palm trees that are actually on the sides of the depot building now, moving them out to the front. Uh, so that's what, that's what those are. And they're surrounding a fountain, a lower, a low scale fountain. Uh, the yellow squares you see on the plan are stone plinths that you can sit on. Uh, so they're lower than this podium kind of height. Uh, and the paving pattern is a, sort of a simple grid, so it allows the pedestrian circulation that was being talked about to be able to get to the station, people to be able to cross it, and to allow for uh, flexible activities to be able to be programmed into the space going forward. So it's not heavily furnished at this point in terms of uh, what would go into it now, but we're hoping for uh, uses in the adjacent buildings that will be able to spill out onto that space and uh, have visual connections to it. This reddish color paving is a differentiation in paving color for uh, potential restaurants or other retail uses to have indoor outdoor activities associated with it. And we're also uh, preserving the, the other uh, loquat tree that's in, in between the two buildings now so that would stay as, as is. Um, I think, uh, and, and simply, you know, we also have a curb all along El Camino so that, you know, we don't have car access there anymore. We've kind of stretched it out so it's a continuation of the curb line that's there now. So the difference, you know, between now and, and the proposed is sort of night and day, I guess I would call it, in that it's a much more friendly environment. It's a much more pedestrian friendly environment. And we think it's a really fitting center to the, to the space. I'm going to pick on the side of you. <laughs> So these are just a couple of um, 3D models representing the space here. We have the, the plaza here framed by the, the four palm trees that Paul was just describing. This is the one-story terrace on building seven with a two-story uh, retail building here. Uh, this is the, of course, the historic depot in the center. And then you can just see the start of building eight to the south here. And then this is the uh, sort of landscape rendering showing some of the activity that could be possible in the plaza. Do you want to? I think uh, without, without belaboring any of the points that we made, I think you could, this is the three-dimensional version of what we're showing you in plan in terms of the plants to be able to sit on the edges uh, and where the, where the water feature is flanking the palms. And just a little sense of the scale of the space. So this is the elevation of buildings seven to the north, the historic depot, and building eight to the south. And so this illustrates how the height comes down as we go towards the depot and then builds back up heading towards the south. Uh, again, the one-story terrace here, the one-story terrace of building eight, uh, stepping up to two stories and then, and then three stories. Um, to the north, we have the closest points of the building is 18 foot six. Uh, and then as we span towards the front of the building, the setback is 34 foot eight. The closest point of building eight, because it's a larger building, is actually 35 foot nine inches, uh, going up to almost 50 feet as you go towards El Camino Real. So then we go to the residential building architecture. And um, probably the most similar building in town that you're familiar with, uh, just right across the street, is Pacific Hacienda. It's similar in that it's a three and four story residential building. It also has similar mission style architecture to the architecture that we're proposing as well with an underground garage. Um, our garage is actually not completely underground, it's a couple feet above ground, but it's a, it's a very similar uh, sort of prototype to what we're proposing for our buildings. Um, also the courtyard architecture that you'll see um, highlighted in our buildings is similar to Pacific Hacienda, so I think this is a, a good um, sort of reference point to what we're proposing. So just to get oriented with the project, I think you're basically familiar, but I'll run through the, the site plan quickly. Um, the concept north of Holly Street, Holly is just right on the right-hand edge here, um, is a series of residential buildings. There's actually four buildings 
oriented around courtyards that face El Camino Real. Uh, building one is furthest to the north, building two, three, and four is just north of Holly. Um, so these buildings all now, they were originally proposed as, three, as four stories. Uh, now all of them have elements that are both three and four stories. And I'll give you an evolution of how those buildings have evolved over time uh, later in the slideshow. And actually, while we're here, I'd like to have Paul um, just talk a little bit about the overall landscape concept for the site. Okay, we'll do that, do that briefly. Uh, based on what you, what you see up here, we have, we have our, our streetscape. We have some uh, slides that we'll show you a little bit for a little bit bigger, so it's a little easier to see. But we have a, a sort of a, a coherent street tree plan, which we don't have now, uh, to be able to, to flank uh, El Camino. And anywhere you don't see a tree, it's because of existing utilities or utilities that can't move. Uh, but otherwise, it's utilities are being are being moved, and trees are being uh, placed all along, all along that edge. And we have varied setbacks. We have public. We have some public plaza spaces that are down at grade, and then you step up to the building. These these spaces, this courtyard here, are on top of the on top of the garage. So they vary in height above above El Camino, depending upon where we are on the site. Uh, and then there's there's surface parking and and driveway entrances in between. Um, yeah, the, so the idea behind these courtyards is to be the courtyards that are up above are, are private use spaces for the residents. The courtyards that are down at street level are publicly available. They have some have fountains, some, most have benches and, and enhanced paving that's off to the side of the sidewalks. There's a place to stop along the way if you like. Um, and then in the, uh, on, the, on the east side of the building, there's, uh, uh, there's tree planting, which I think we have a before and after kind of slide we'll show you in a moment. Uh, as well as emergency access, uh, access for the rail, for, for rail potentially in the future for, for being able to work on tracks, uh, uh, fire access, those, those sorts of things, as well as a pedestrian way that runs along the back of the buildings. Oops, wrong way. Yeah. We should keep going. Sure. And then this is, um, now Holly is on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, residential buildings five and six are south of Holly. Uh, and then we've already discussed the retail buildings, uh, seven and eight, that, that flank the, the depot building. So also with this project, along with the, the depot and the, um, the residential buildings, uh, we're improving connections east-west with a series of crosswalks uh, with improved paving along El Camino. These crosswalks would be um, at Holly, at San Carlos Avenue, at Cherry, and at Olive. Um, and then also, as, as Paul was just describing, there's street tree planting um, along the entire site as well. So for the elevations of the uh, residential buildings, this is actually an elevation of building four, which is mostly four stories. But you can see that all, all buildings share some of the same characteristics, which is uh, a really vary in, in height and also in, in roof forms. We have gable roofs, we have some parapets, we have hip roofs. Um, we have on building four this little uh, tower element here. Uh, the buildings that flank Holly Street also get a little bit of extra stone treatment um, just to sort of flank Holly Street on either side as a gateway. Instead of at an increasing height, which was one of our previous design concepts on either side of Holly, uh, we've actually lowered these elevations at Holly down to three stories and um, just brought up the, the material treatment at those corners instead of increasing the height. Uh, for the retail buildings, we have a little bit more vibrant color palette. Uh, we have metal roofs uh, that would be a green copper patina color, uh, bronze storefront windows, uh, canopies. Definitely has a much more sort of public feel, retail feel uh, to the buildings that would be flanking the, the depot. This is an image of, again, this is building four with the um, added stone detail at the corner. The building five on the opposite side of Holly would have a similar treatment with the stone at the corner um, coming down to three stories instead of the tower that was there uh, in previous versions. Uh, a little bit of uh, information about this. The streetscape is a little bit more blown up version of what we were looking at before. So the, the, the plaza spaces I was talking about that are down at grade that are publicly available is here and then steps up to the podium and there's a gate there. And then the, the podium spaces itself, which will allow connectivity between the buildings. Uh, and along the public right of way, we have a 10 foot walk and, the, and continuous street trees and new street lights. Uh, and then backup tree planting behind the, uh, the street trees. So there's sort of multiple layers where we have the ability to do that. And there's a terrace kind of planting so that uh, there's some step up in, in planting up to, the, up to the building structure to give us a good transition from the street to the buildings themselves. 
Uh, well, yeah, this is this is sort of the before and after from the EIR to, to today. Uh, one of the, one significant thing uh, about this, from from my perspective, is that it's the quantity of trees that were planted on the east side of the building. Sort of the the, the big difference as you look at the plan. Um, I think in the in the this original one we had, I think, 26 trees along that edge, and after uh, input we've gotten from both the community and the planning commission and lots of people. Uh, we've, we've worked on how to get more trees in that space to help screen those buildings and to soften the, the, the look. So uh, the lower slide is just a portion between uh, the north side and Holly here is, is all you see now. Uh, but there's, a, uh, there's 111 trees in the lower one and 26 in the upper one. So there's 85 more trees that we were able to plant on the back of the building. And the variety of trees are, there's, there's various kinds of upright trees and, and wider growing trees depending upon the specific um, uh, constraints we had in ver various areas, both for uh, train right of way and fire access and all of that. But the idea was to get height and to modulate the view to help break down the the, the elevational view that you that you get from the the east side, obviously looking over over the embankment towards the buildings. So, uh, the, yeah, oh, that's right. We have the elevation. I forgot about that. Uh, just it's just a, a partial elevation to give you a sense. The you know the trees are showing light on here, but there's uh, you know, trees of uh, Italian cypress kind of scale here, and uh, there's upright maples and upright oaks and a variety of different sorts of trees, but the general scale is what you see here. Um, and then this is the El Camino side with the street trees in the foreground. So the last time the project was uh, before you, it was for the EIR study, and so the major changes that we've um, incorporated since then is an overall reduction of mass in the four story of the buildings. And this occurs through all of the residential buildings. And I'll show you some slides as to exactly how that was done. But overall, in the six residential buildings, it's, it's over 34,000 square feet that was taken off of the fourth floor from the EIR version of the project to the version that you're, you're looking at today. Um, and then with the increased uh, tree planting, which was, it was quite a trick. Um, I mean, obviously our goal was, is to plant as much uh, on the east side as, as possible. But what that took was actually relocating a lot of utilities in the plan. And also, it took um, coordinating with the fire department to have them reduce their emergency vehicle access. And so we have some creative solutions with them um, on how to serve the east side of the project for emergency vehicles without basically providing an emergency vehicle access drive aisle across the whole back of the project. So that's how that was accomplished. OK, so these slides, I'll, I'll go through a quick history of the project, um, just the major site plan changes. In order to incorporate all of these site plan changes, um, there's lots of other fine-grained detail that I won't go into, but I'm just going to hit the, the major massing points from a site plan perspective. Um, so as, as we've described, but I don't know that anyone's seen just the layout of the site plan as it was originally proposed, um, this is the proposal for the 319-unit project um, that was originally presented to, to SAMTRANS. So it's 319 units. It was all four stories. Um, Holly Street is, is right here. We had three large residential buildings north of Holly, um, instead of the four that we have currently. And you can see that the massing of the buildings um, was much different than the finer grain texture that we, we went, went for later. So um, after the uh, original proposal was, was accepted in the, and, and we were selected to move forward, we started really digging into the details of the project a little bit. Our first um, sort of public presentation of the project was the slide that you see down below. This is the original concept of having the, the four buildings north of Holly. Uh, we introduced some three-story elements. The color is a little bit washed out here, so I'll highlight for you. The, the lighter color is actually three-story portion of the project, and the darker color here is the four-story portion of the project. So um, building one was all four stories. Building two had these two areas here that were, uh, were three-stories. Building three had these two units here that were three stories. Building four and five were all four stories. And then building six dropped off uh, at most adjacent to the retail building here. So now that version is, is at the top of your screen here. And we took that to what was in the L'Oreola neighborhood group um, to get some, some input on what we were proposing. And the first comment they said was, well, how does this relate to us? And so we started talking with them. I think our first plans didn't actually, I think the, the renderings were cut off at the tracks. We didn't actually show the eastern street grid. And so it was um, you know, a, a proper criticism that we should really um, expand our vision to the east side. And so the next um, iteration was 
breaking the buildings down relating to the eastern neighborhood street grid into running view corridors through these buildings um, that aligned with the, the street grid on the eastern neighborhood side. Because uh, you can see before, it didn't have a relationship to the eastern neighborhoods. Um, and now um, what we've done is, is create view quarters between the buildings by remassing the buildings where we could. Um, turns out there's, there's a large storm sewer easement across here that cannot be relocated. And so the massings for building one and two wasn't quite as flexible as it was for buildings three and four. So what we did there was we actually reduced the building height and set back and plan at these areas. Um, so we're further away from um, the eastern neighborhoods and we're lower. Um, and this is the version that was actually put forth for the EIR. So we had, sorry, the mouse is disappearing here. Uh, Three-story portion aligning with Riverton, three stories aligning with Inverness. Inverness. Um, we had a complete break in the buildings between two and three aligning with Sylvan, and another break in the buildings between three and four aligning with Springfield. And so that was the, the the revised massing that went forward for the EIR. So now that massing is at the top of your screen. <clears throat> and again, the, the changes that we've made from this version till the version that you see today, <clears throat> sorry, is um, a reduction of the overall mass of the fourth floor. This is the criticism that we were hearing from the east side is that the floor, fourth floor is, um, there's just too much of the fourth floor. So we went back to the drawing board and we reduced the four story elements uh, across the board and we definitely weighted it towards the east side. And I'll show you a slide as, as to how that affects the perception from the east side, um, stepping from three stories up to four. But you can see it, building one now, um, the units that, that face the east side are three stories. Same thing for building two. And the southern portion of building two is entirely three stories. Building three, both ends now have come down to three stories. Building four, similarly, three stories on the ends. Building five, three stories at the end. And building six was contracted back, and you can see it's mostly three stories with a little bit of four story here. So when we did that, you can see that the massing for building one at four stories were previously proposed. If you're standing on the east side of Old County Road and looking at the roof line of a three story building, um, basically you would see all four stories um, fully presented in, in the previous version. Um, what you see now when you pull the four-story back, by basically pulling the um, four-story back about 35 feet, the, the sight line from the east side of Old County Road is very similar for the three-story portion of the roof as it is for the four-story portion of the roof. So it doesn't present the same four-story high wall. It really does tuck back. And so that was the intention of reducing the height closest to the east side um, it is, it was to create a, a sort of terracing effect so that it's not all presented as four stories facing the east side. And so um, the project as it's presented today is, is, is on the top screen and then there were some further sort of changes that were proposed as part of the conditions of approval from the planning department. Um, this is to further reduce the four story element and this is, it mainly affects buildings three and buildings five and six. So the proposal would be to actually take the fourth floor area off of building three and then to separate buildings five and six. There's a, currently a walkway that connects buildings five and six which allows them to share uh, vertical circulation, stairs, elevators, et cetera. And so by separating those, um, the small portion of the building that was four stories on building six no longer became viable as, as four stories, the elevators, two stairs, et cetera. Um, there just wasn't going to be anything left of that fourth floor. So essentially building six now is, um, is all three stories. So this is building three uh, at the fourth floor as it's currently proposed. There's five units at this level. There's three two-bedroom units that actually face the east side. There's two three-bedroom units that face um, El Camino Real. And so in the conditions of approval, um, that, that floor would be eliminated. So building six, similarly, this was connected to building five, allowing a three-bedroom unit and two two-bedroom units on the fourth floor. And by separating this walkway between buildings five and six, essentially we would lose those three units as well. So there's three units on building three, uh, five units on building three, and three units on building six um, that would be proposed to be eliminated as part of the conditions of approval. <clears throat> um, the reason that it's difficult to 
retain the units on Building 6 when you separate the, the walkway that connected between the two buildings is essentially we had, in the top slide, we had one shared lobby, we had a shared trash room, we had a shared elevator. Um, the yellow highlighted areas show where we had to add vertical circulation in order to separate those two buildings. Um, when we added all the vertical circulation, it actually eliminated six parking spaces. So again, when you limit the six parking spaces and add the vertical circulation, it just doesn't support any more units than what we'd, we'd be showing with the uh, three stories at, at Building 6. So just to summarize the, the evolution of the project in, in terms of fourth floor area, um, we've reduced the fourth floor by over 34,000 square feet in the plan that it's proposed now. Um, the reduction, if we included the conditions of approval changes, would be a reduction of the fourth floor of over 47,000 square feet. Um, so that would be a 50% reduction from what was originally proposed in the EIR. Currently, it's about a 37% reduction from what was proposed in the EIR. So there's a, just the, the large scale changes that we're describing when we're talking about these changes. Okay. And that's the end of the slideshow. Do you want to go back? No, no, just. So I'd like to just briefly go over the uh, major recommendations from the Planning Commission with respect to this project. As Sherry has indicated, the conditions required that the fourth floor in Building 3 be set back from the eastern facade to match the same kind of setback there is on Buildings 1 and 2. In discussions with them and in looking at their, the, the design of the building, it's their conclusion that they won't keep the third floor. The, recommend, the recommendation from the city, from the Planning Commission is to remove the walkways which are on second, third, and fourth level to create, create greater visual separation between those buildings. And again, when they took a look at um, how that condition would ripple through things like elevators and walkways, they're to sit there, as they've indicated in their presentation, they would remove the fourth story portion of Building 6. Conditions of approval also include a number of uh, conditions that address architectural refinement, which would be part of the Planning Commission's review of these buildings as part of the uh, design review process. Conditions of approval also include um, additional landscape screening for Building 8 to make, uh, make that building as um, not, not perceptible as possible from the east neighborhoods. An increase in the maintenance of the landscaping for the additional planting that would be done on the berm to 25 years. And the thinking behind that from the Planning Commission was that there is uncertainty about electrification, about high-speed rail, and they wanted to make sure that the landscaping was maintained through that time period uh, before it became the city's responsibility. Initially, there had been some thought we would not provide, that this project would not provide on-site loading spaces. Two on-site spaces will be provided, one to the south east of Building 8, and one is a non-exclusive space within the transit center. The project also includes a transportation demand management program parking management plan for buildings five and six to provide daytime parking for the employees in buildings five and six, agreement between Sam Trans and the developer for non-exclusive use of 47 spaces in the commuter parking lot uh, to 
provide for the additional parking needs of buildings five and six, or I'm sorry, six and seven. Um, the inclusion of a residential parking program that the developer is responsible for funding the um, design of that program. Um, the addition of electric charging stations for electric cars and adding to the land use regulations in the plan development limitations on outdoor amplification. Changes to the transit center include um, making sure that when we look at that in detail in the next phase that it will accommodate the relocation of shuttles and taxis should that be the decision of the city council. The South Railroad corridor requirements are a continuation of the streetscape that would be across the frontage of the mixed use and transit village to continue on as far south as we can. There's some uh, existing auto-oriented uses that may limit how far south it can come to um, the city's boundary. And a, an additional condition that requires that the street frontage improvements be completed um, by the completion of the transit center. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your kind attention and staff as well as Sam Trans and the legacy team are available to respond to your questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Olbert, you wanted to do something here? Yes, I did. Thank you. We'll get to questions in a few minutes. Although not of me, you're not, not allowed to ask questions of me. Just kidding. <laughs> you're standing there, you get questions. Oh, very good. It's all set up. Um, those of you who have been to uh, these meetings on a number of occasions uh, will remember that um, I have asked a number, at a number of points in time for what I call an integrated financial analysis of this project. And part of the reason I wanted to do that is because I think that my, my instinct was that we were looking at a bit of an artificial and contrived situation where we have the applicant legacy uh, uh, pushing the project, and at the same time, we have a landowner in the background. Um, and late last week, I think we all received a uh, uh, copy of the model that the city's consultants, RSG, have put together, um, or had put together. Oops, that's not me. That's really interesting. Have somebody else's presentation. Um, had put together, and so I actually spent the weekend um, putting together um, a financial model, which I want to share with you some of the, the uh, outtakes from, essentially. Um, keep in mind, please, that this is something that's uh, a bit of a work in progress. I, I've learned an awful lot from talking to uh, the RSG folks over the last three or four days. Uh, it's been sort of a very intensive introduction to how uh, these types of projects are evaluated. It's been a lot of fun. I haven't had this much fun since I was a CFO at a couple of startup companies trying to pitch venture capitalists to raise money. Um, uh, and um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see a number of the details here change, but there's some basic messages that I do want to make sure that uh, the council is aware of because they will certainly be guiding my thinking. First and foremost, let me talk a little bit about divided versus integrated economics. Um, what I mean by that is imagine a hypothetical situation where uh, I'm the property owner for this land and uh, I approach uh, uh, somebody to develop it for me and I say, uh, you have free reign to develop this however you think is appropriate uh, and that the city will approve, but uh, the one non-negotiable thing is that the ground lease is $100 million a year. And uh, if for some reason you were silly enough to take that commission on, you would be approaching the city and you would legitimately be saying, I have to build Transamerica pyramid style apartment houses all the way from one end of this project to the other in order to make the numbers pencil out. And that would be a true statement. But the reason it would be a true statement is because the ground lease is way too high. And that's part of the, in my mind, of the importance of looking at the integrated economics is to, is to make that go away and say, okay, if we were looking at a project in total, what makes sense, what's supportable, what's necessary from the financial point of view, and hence what flexibility do we have in what we approve. And that's what I've tried to render here in this, in this slide a little bit. You can't see the type being so small, but that's legacy and SAM trans, and you can end up with an unusually or a, a not uh, useful conclusion for the city. 
So what did, what did I do? I basically just took the RSG model as it was, uh, made a couple of corrections to some very minor mistakes that were in it. And what I did is I included the cost of the land and also included its appreciation and values. So over the course of the project, at the end of the project, you're saying, well, I invested so many tens of millions of dollars to acquire the land. It has to be worth something at the end as well, independent of the development itself. So I get that back. That's just a residual value. I ignored the ground lease because the ground lease basically talks to how you take the total pie and you divvy it up between uh, the property owner and the uh, um, uh, uh, developer. I also included uh, all of the fees um, uh, in the project and put them in in such a way that as you tweak the size of the project, the size of the fees changes change as well. And the bottom line is there's a number of different ways that the industry uses to evaluate what's an acceptable financial return on this project. But one of the ways, and the ways that I, way I'm using here, is at least a 6.5% rate of return on the pre-tax cash flows. So what do we have? Make, you make some assumption that the land has to be purchased, has to be valued at the start of the project. That's part of the integration at $100 a square foot, which RSG tells me may actually be a little bit high. And I assume in this initial case, I said it appreciates 5% annually in, in value. Um, I suspect in the last couple of years in San Carlos, real estate's been appreciating faster than that, even land, but that's a different issue. Um, I had the BMR at the full rate that our ordinance requires. I set it at 280 residential units, and what pops out at the end is 7.7% or 7.69% rate of return. That's substantially above the 6.5%. That's the threshold, which is a good thing. That means the project with those parameters uh, would be a go. Um, you can look at one of the nice things about having a model is you can look at a number of sensitivities, and one of the first things to ask yourself is, well, how small could it be? in terms of residential size uh, and still achieve that 6.5% threshold. Um, and I take these with a grain of salt because there are a number of issues other than the pure financial ones that we'd have to consider here, not the least of which is what is zoned to be able to be built here. But as you can see, 6.5% rate of return with a 5% land appreciation, no change to the BMR waiver other than the fact that it's smaller because it's a smaller project, you have a substantial reduction in the number of units, more than half. If you have some kind of land appreciation in, but smaller, because you may argue, well, it's commercial land, it's raw land, it's, it's not going to grow at 5%, you still see with the full boat BMR, you still see that uh, there's a, a substantial potential reduction in the size of the project purely from a financial point of view. You can also do some other things. Um, one of the things that I learned for, after putting the model together, which I did not know, although after talking to staff, uh, it did not surprise them, um, I said, well, what happens if we eliminate the retail component? Because that's, that's obviously a particular component in here. And interestingly enough, it has no effect on the economics of the project at all. It's essentially break even. Even more interesting is if you eliminate the office component in the model, it actually improves the rate of return. Basically, the residential project is carrying and subsidizing the commercial office space. Um, and again, neither of those things were a surprise to staff. Uh, they were a surprise to me and particularly given some of the concerns about um, sight lines and whatnot associated with the commercial building and the fact that, that you know, that's part of the reason the parking lot gets moved so far south, uh, I think that was a very interesting outcome. Those last two kind of busy tables down the bottom, um, I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but basically, uh, to me, the value of this type of analysis and one of the reasons I had been asking staff to, to do this for some time is it allows you to do what if kinds of things and say, well, what is the relationship between uh, if we were to grant a waiver on BMR versus land depreciation assumptions versus how big of a residential build out, what proportion of the 280 do we actually build? Um, and as you can see, in quite a few of those scenarios, given the other assumptions, if you're using a 6.5% threshold, an awful lot of those boxes actually are a go. Um, Obviously, if you're the developer and the landowner, you want it to be as high a number as you possibly can. Uh, but, and we want to make sure we don't go below that. But the point is, in terms of takeaways, is my sense is there's an awful lot of value here. There's plenty of value here for Legacy and Samtrans to share. Now, they may have to come up with a different structure of ground lease. They may have to come up with a different structure of economic incentives to do it. But there is enough there to share. I mentioned several times before, project economics are not the only thing to consider. We do have to consider what's allowed to be built there by our own zoning rules. 
Uh, and, and just as important, but a different kind of dimension, the community economics need, need to be assessed as well. Uh, you know, for example, if you were to eliminate um, the commercial space, well, one of the things the city is very short of, as we all know, is class A commercial space. Um, and eliminating that has some repercussions that are non-financial in nature that we'd have to assess. But make no mistake about it, um, one of the things that, that is very important to remember, this is a combined project. We need to look at it in a combined way. And from everything I can gather, we actually have a lot more flexibility than at least I thought we did. Uh, and I was led to believe we did, um, as long as we make sure that we look at this as an in, in an integrated fashion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Um, the city attorney would like me to sort of end our study session at this time. It's 7 o'clock. We would move into our regular meeting. Do we need to take a couple of minute break? Is that what you want, Mr. City Attorney? Yeah, we need time, I think, to set up for the regular meeting. Um, and then if you were wanting to continue the study session, you mm -hmm. could make a motion to continue the study session now to, the, to when it uh, commences on the regular agenda item. Okay, so we need take a motion for that right now? Do you need a motion for that? Well, you, uh, the, well, the reason, uh, well, the city manager's um, just commenting that you may not have to do it, but I prefer just procedurally that you um, continue the study session. If that's your intent, you don't have to. Okay, so we're going to continue the study session in our next, uh, at the 7 o'clock meeting, and uh, we'll, we'll see what, where it fits in there. I think it's going to be delayed a little bit longer because we're going to go through some other items before that. So, so we're going to take uh, five minutes right now. Thank you.